I'm, uh, oops, there we go, it's a update. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Clarissa Kripke. I'm uh, on the clinical faculty at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm a family physician and I take care of transition age youth and adults with developmental disabilities and run a program called the Office of Development Primary Care. And our mission is to improve the health outcomes for people with developmental disabilities through clinical services, advocacy, research, and training. And I have no commercial interests to disclose. And I want to thank some of our funders, the Stepsky Foundation, the Wyth Foundation, and Golden Gate Regional Center. So today, uh, my agenda is to talk about what sensory differences are, what the sensory system is, and how to recognize sensory processing differences, talk about how to accommodate them, uh, how, uh, and, and the implications for communication, for education, and for inclusion and emotional regulation, and how to appreciate sensory processing differences because we are all unique human beings. Who we are is very much a, a, a part, how, how we perceive the world is very much part of who we are and all that diversity is, um, it, it's, it's beautiful and, uh, and there's, there's a lot to be said even for people who, whose uh, sensory processing is really atypical. So what is, let's start with what is the sensory system? So we have both external senses and internal senses. The external senses are the things that we normally think about when we think about sensory processing, our, our hearing through our ears, our vision through our eyes, our smell, our touch, our taste. But our sensory system is more than that. Um, it, we need intact end organs, and when I say end organs, I mean um, your eyes, your ears, your tongue, uh, th those are end organs. Those need to be intact, so if you're missing an eye or missing an ear or there's damage to it or something, then, then obviously your, your sensory processing will be impacted. But sometimes those end organs are completely normal um, and are functioning just fine. But the connections between those end organs and the brain, from the eye to the brain, or from the ear to the brain, or from our, our other our nose to the brain, there's there may be a disconnect there, or a slowdown there, or a difference there. Um, and then it's also what the brain does with it when it gets a signal. So how does the brain interpret it? How does it process it? How quickly does it do it? And then how does it take that information and translate it into some sort of adaptive, meaningful response? Um, so for example, I might put my hand on the stove and I can feel it's hot and I know it's hot and I know my hand is burning, my mind work, my, my intellect is fine and my, my skin and, and the, the nerves on my hand are fine, but I don't have the motor initiation skill in my brain to take my hand off. And so my hand just sits there. And people could interpret that as, oh, she doesn't, she, she doesn't have good safety awareness. She doesn't, know, she doesn't know hot from cold. She doesn't know how to use a stove. Well, that, that's not really the problem. The problem is a motor initiation problem uh, and a, a problem with getting my, my brain telling my arm to do something in response to the sensation that I'm taking in. So our sensory system is that whole loop. It's the whole loop from the external organs, the connections to the brain, what the brain, brain does with it, and then how it processes some sort of adaptive response, some sort of response that, um, that's, that's useful. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, let's talk about some, some things that maybe we're a little less familiar with, like when, when the connections between the hearing and the brain are, are slowed down. So that could be like an auditory 
a, an auditory processing disorder where um, the sounds are there, you can hear them, um, and your brain can understand them once they get there, but it's slowed down. So if I am saying a sentence like this, what you might hear is, I sentence this. And it may be very hard to interpret that. And it may be, and somebody could think, oh gosh, well they don't understand, they're not paying attention, they're tuning out. That you know, pe people could very much confuse that that sl slowness where you're you're only catching every third word because your your brain has to catch up because the connections are slow and your brain your brain can't keep up with the speed of the speech, um, and and then isn't isn't able to understand what's going on. But the same person might understand the same sentence if you slowed it way down, or if you wrote it down, or if you conveyed the information in some other way, they might understand it just fine. So it's not really a cognitive intellectual problem with understanding the sentence or understanding language, but they still may have a difficult time keeping up in a conversation or, um, or learning from someone who's speaking at a normal, at a normal rate, um, for example. And uh, let's see, other, other uh, hearing issues might come from the inability to distinguish one sound from another. So most people in this room are probably tuning out the hum of my projector and focusing on the sound of my voice, but not everybody's brain does that. Some people's brains, the sound of the hum of my projector might be competing for their attention just as much as my voice. And we've all had this, I, I think probably most of us today have had this experience of um, walking into that uh, exhibit hall, for example, and it was very echoey and there was a lot going on there and it was just a wall of sound. Couldn't distinguish a single conversation. You could, you could there were lots of conversations going on in that room, you could hear, but it was just, a wall of sound. Did, did anybody have that experience? Yeah. Um, and yet, at the same time, most of us, maybe not all of us, but most of us were able to go to the different exhibitors in the room and when we got close and we focused, we could have a conversation with the person even though, even through that wall of sound. But not everybody's brain, not, not everybody can do that. Um, sometimes <coughs> even an, an ordinary um, amount of distractions and sounds and hops and, um, and hums and things that, that go on in a normal room are uh, to create that wall of sound experience for people. Um, and, and they may not be able to, to tune themselves out of it to focus in on a specific conversation or a specific sound. Um, uh, this can make noisy environments or even environments which aren't loud but have a lot of uh, sounds coming from different places extremely overstimulating and it can be very difficult to follow group conversations, even if you might do fine one-on-one. -on -one. It might make it very difficult to go to a party, even though um, something smaller might work just fine. Um, so uh, the, the same kind of thing can happen with your vision. So uh, you can have people who are, say, cortically blind. And when we say cortically blind, that means that your eyes work fine. There's no cataracts, there's no cornea problem. You know, you're, you're seeing colors and textures and, um, and light, but once it gets to the brain, the brain doesn't process it into objects. So you could, um, I, I can see blue and shiny and stuff on this chair. Um, and if I think about it hard enough, I can realize, okay, that's about the shape. It, this must be a chair, but you go like this, it's a completely different object. And, and now I have to do that whole process again. Um, and so that can present itself as, um, you know, being very intolerant to change because anybody makes, you know, you clean up my room or you change something in my environment and I have to reprocess the whole space and that is very overwhelming and I'm very upset with you for moving that chair half an inch, um, which seems like a, you know, a simple thing to do. It wasn't no big deal why you're reacting like that, but it might be very, very disorienting for somebody who has that kind of, uh, that kind of issue. Um, and there are, um, 
there are, uh, you know, you might be able to, to see someone's facial expressions, but your brain doesn't automatically recognize the person. Um, so that, you know, some people are face blind that way. Um, or uh, people who are colorblind, that's a common example of people who uh, take in information from their, from their environment through their eyes, but maybe don't have as many, distinguish as many shades of color, or there are some people who distinguish more shades of color than the rest of us and may have very finely attuned, and, um, and that might be, that might make them a wonderful artist, or it might be very distracting, depending on the context. Um, and there are sometimes, uh, so there, there are some people who have these kinds of issues where um, if they wear special glasses that have special tints, then they can process words on a page better, Erling glasses. Um, so if you had someone who um, has some of these kinds of connection and, and brain issues, you might be able to taste, your taste buds may be just fine, but you may be a very picky eater because, um, because the, the combinations of tastes in a, in a recipe may be, may be very um, complex and overstimulating and there's too much information. It's not blending together into one cohesive flavor, but it's just a lot of information and from a lot of different um, sensations that can be very overwhelming. And you might see that person be very picky about their eating and only want to eat one food at a time and want a plate where the peas don't touch the mashed potatoes or you know that, that kind of thing might be an adaptive response to that kind of sensory processing. And when you think about how much sensory processing is needed to eat, you have to get the food in your mouth, you need to feel where the food is in your mouth and get it to where your teeth are to chew it. You have to chew it up feel and sense when it's chewed enough to swallow, move it to the right position to swallow it. That requires a lot of complicated sensory movement combinations to do, and a lot of people with disabilities have difficulty with that and therefore have problems with, with swallow and, and aspirating their food and, and eating, and that can, can partly be a sensory issue. Um, uh, and it might make the process of eating very stressful um, for some people. Usually we think of food as love and food as pleasure, and, um, but people who have very significant issues with, uh, with that sensory processing issue might not enjoy food quite as much as the rest of us do, or some of us do. Um, uh, other things, uh, sensitivities to smell, it can make, um, even if somebody doesn't have an allergy in the sense of getting hives or, um, or swelling up when they're exposed to certain smells like perfumes, they, they can be very overwhelmed with it in the same kind of way. It can be too much information. Um, uh, and we can accommodate that by being scent free, by not wearing perfumes to, to group events. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's a little bit about the external senses, but we also have internal senses. And these we may be a little less familiar with. They are our vestibular system, our movement, and our body awareness or our proprioception. So the internal senses help us to know whether we're moving or whether we're still, whether which way's up, which way's down. Um, they tell us a concept of inside and outside space, what's internal to me and what's external to me. And there are receptors in the inner ear. So, uh, so if those get, um, if those receptors are damaged or not working um, uh, in a typical way, you might be dizzy. Um, you, might, uh, you might have very uncontrolled movements. Um, that and not not be able to really understand where your um, where your body is in space. You might have difficulty with purposeful movement, like picking up this this. You know, I might keep not know where my hand is in relationship to the stapler and have a hard time getting it. Um, uh, it can be uh, there, there can be a lot of implications to that. And then the body awareness, the proprioceptive, is is understanding where 
know, like I'm not looking at my hand, but I know it's behind me, and I can put it up here, and I know it's up here, even though I'm not looking at it. So how do I know that I have some sense in me that tells me where my body is in space, and um, and that's and that's really important. So people who have difficulties with that might try to get. You might see people flap, and that movement helps them to tell where their body in, is in space, or they might want different kinds of pressure to give more feedback, or a weighted spoon so they, they can feel, they just, it just helps to give a little more feedback um, uh, so that they know where their body is in space. If, they're, if, they're, um, if, if you're pointing to, let's say, a, a keyboard, if, if you touch it, this may be here because I can't really feel when I've touched it, so I'm doing this sloppily. Mm -hmm. But if when I touch it, I get a little, a little reaction. You know, somebody pushes back, then okay, I know I've touched it now and I've gotten that feedback. So that that helps me with, um, with being able to type or point, point to letters on a letter board um, because I'm getting a little more feedback um, on uh, on where my body is in, in space. Um, so. Um, so sensory processing is the method by which the nervous system, it's the method the nervous system uses to recognize, organize, and make sense of all the incoming sensory input that we get. And it includes information from both the external environment and input from inside the body to create an adaptive response. And the adaptive response is to do something useful, um, to do something purposeful. Uh, uh, in response to it. So uh, sensory processing problems can lead to problems with adaptive responses. Um, I gave you the stove example. Um, or uh, things can happen like um, you can get a sensation and it can trigger a, trigger a startle. So you know, if you take me by surprise, I might you know, swat you when I didn't really mean to hurt you because it took it, um, I got something triggered before my brain had a chance to process that um, who you were and why you were touching me and and that, and to understand that you're not a threat and so you know I just get you um, and I'm not a bad person and I'm not trying to but that can just happen um, and uh, and um, you can get overwhelmed very easily by all of the sensory information that's coming in. Um, you can, if, if you're not good at making sense of it and processing it and, and having it um, coalesce into something that, uh, that, makes, that makes sense to you and that you can use, then life is very overwhelming. Life, is, life can be very overstimulating. It can be, it can be too much. Um, and, um, and so one thing is that that can lead to meltdowns um, if you have too much information coming in for too long, you can just lose it. Um, and we probably most of this at some point in our lives have had this happen to us where um, we were in too overstimulating an environment, a casino or something like that, and we just you know had to get out of there. Um, or, or we couldn't get out of there and therefore we lost it. Um, a, a concert, something like that, where it was too crowded, too, too noisy, too much going on, and we just couldn't deal with it. Um, people who have sensory processing differences often learn how to cover it up. They often learn how to fake it. Um, and they might not be fully processing the sights and sounds around them. Um, and therefore they get excluded or labeled incapable or um, uh, because, not because they are incapable of understanding, but just because they aren't capable of processing quickly enough um, or enough of the information uh, or the important information to respond fast enough to keep up in a social situation or in, in, a, in a classroom. Um, they, they, may, they may just, um, by the time they organize their response, the teacher is already on to the next topic, or the, the group is already on to the next topic, or the next person has already spoken up before you get your chance, um, because it's just taken you that even even a split second too quick, too too quick can just 
um, uh, you can just be chronically, chronically a beat behind everybody else, and, and, and that can really affect your ability to participate. Um, to make things more complicated, sometimes the brain does really interesting things where they'll take input from the ear and put that input into, say, a vision spot or take um, or into an emotion spot or uh, so some people so you can have very interesting scrambles of what is coming in and what your brain does with it and these can be very unique um, there's uh, so um, sometimes you can have a color triggering an emotion sometimes you could have uh, you could have emotions triggering numbers. Sometimes you could have colors triggering letters. Uh, you can have any any kind of unique combinations. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, so this is a picture made by a friend of mine who uh, drew what she sees when she hears my name. Got me. Um, and there's some really great art that's been made by people who have synesthesia. Who, um, who respond in different ways. And of course, if you have these kinds of phenomena, you might notice things that other people don't know, uh, notice, um, because subtleties may, uh, subtleties in sound may create very different visual displays for you, for example. Um, and so uh, somebody who's hearing, so, so you may, different subtle differences in sound may be very dramatic when they're translated into color, that kind of thing. So they may notice things that other people don't notice, and that can be a gift as well as, as a challenge. Um, I, I knew synesthesia can create some interesting practical problems. For example, I, I know somebody who had depression, and he was talking about 300 orange happy, 400 blue depression, and I was really confused, and it sounded like maybe hallucinations or confusion, or I don't know, was he, was, was he psychotic? I, I didn't really know. And then I was like, oh, synesthesia. Mm -hmm. So what had happened was he, he, was on he was depressed, and he was taking a pill for that, which was orange. And his synesthesia, orange is a happy emotion color. Um, and what kind of doctor would give you a blue pill, which is a depression color? And the 450 milligram, the, the next dose up, his doctor said, go from the 300 milligram tablet to the 400 milligram tablet. And so in take, instead of taking an orange pill, now he was taking a blue pill. And the blue pill was a sad color pill for him. And, and he was like, you know, this makes no sense. Why are you making me take this sad pill when I'm depressed? That you're not you're not fixing me. Um, and so I said, oh, just just take take the 450 milligram pill and put it in orange juice. Problem solved. Um, and this could, if if you have that that if you had that particular kind of difference, then you could imagine that you might function really differently in a classroom that's painted yellow than a classroom that's painted blue. Um, for example, or in a bedroom, um, and you might be able to cure depression by by painting the walls or by um, doing uh, doing uh, some, something else to work with that phenomenon. Um, that that interesting brain difference. Um, so uh, so this can get very complicated um, very quickly, and it's very unique and individual. There's no patterns. There's there's no very specific patterns to it. Um, and so, and, and it can be different, so different from, we're all different in how we process our world and, and in, our, in our sensations, but it can be so different from our own experience that it can be very hard to be empathetic and to understand what's going on and it's easy to, to miss things. So, how do you recognize if somebody has a sensory processing difference? Well, the first thing is, don't guess, assess. Um, because people are actually quite lousy at recognizing it. Um, uh, parents can say, oh, I think he sees and hears, and, and maybe he does, but, um, but maybe he doesn't, or maybe, there's, maybe he sees and hears, but, but there are these, these differences, like 
is what situations does he see in here? What does he see in here? How fast does he see in here? Um, there can be nuances there that are um, that are hard to detect, and just by hanging out with somebody or being with them, and um, and if you don't have some sort of way of telling, some sort of fluent, expressive communication, whether you write, whether you speak, whether you use sign language, if you don't have some way of telling people what you're experiencing in your own body, then it can be really hard for somebody else to guess. Um, really, really hard for somebody else to guess, just by looking, just by observing you or, or looking at you. And people who have pretty pro even pretty profound sensory differences may not realize that they process differently, and that, that's, that's really common. Um, my mother, for example, was six before someone got her a pair of glasses, and she didn't go to school because she couldn't benefit from it because she couldn't see. And she put glasses on for the first time when she was about six years old, and it's like, oh, trees have leaves. Like, she never knew that. It was just a blob, it was just a, a green blob. Um, and then she finally got glasses, and oh, you know, there's a lot more fine detail here. Um, and um, and that I, I've had adults. I had um, I, I know an adult who, who got all the way through life, um, not realizing that he was a lot more sensitive to sounds than other people were, and he just assumed everybody experienced the world the same way he did, and that they were all just very stoic. <laughs> that they were all just, you know, they, um, they, they all just, you know, suck it up and that that's the socially appropriate thing to do when you're in pain from sounds and when you're, you know, you, you just pretend like you're not. Um, because that's what everybody was doing. You know, they were all in the same environment as he was and that's what everybody was doing. So I guess this is the expectation. They just did it. And it didn't occur to him that he could ask for an accommodation or he could put some earphones on to block some of that sound or he could do something different because he had no idea he was different than anyone else. Um, and that is actually surprisingly common, um, that people um, grow up their whole lives and not realize that, that they're different. Um, and, and again, we're, we're all unique, so if we, um, we all have at least subtle differences between how we perceive things. There's just sort of a, a broad range of typical, um, but a lot of us in one sense or another fall outside of that, that typical, like you probably know people who are um, really, really bothered when there's a little hum on the radio and then some people who don't even hear it um, and, um, and things like that. So, um, so we're, we're all unique and you know also um, if any of you have ever taken a class in, in uh, the law or criminality or anything like that, that there can be an event um, and so I could do something like that and if I asked everyone in the room to write down what they just saw and what they just experienced, there would be, you know, nobody, nobody's would be identical. Um, there, there would be a different, a different interpretation of what they saw. Some of you would be on your cell phone and would have missed it entirely. Some of you, um, some of you would have thought that that was a very aggressive thing. Um, some of you would, would be thinking that, you know, I suddenly lost my mind. Or um, you know, there'd be a whole, whole variety of interpretations and descriptions of, of what just happened. And so that's. You know that's on a good day, and then if you have people who are whose brains are even more different, um, that that phenomena that we're all familiar with is you know even more pronounced, um, even more. Um, so um, so if if we have a way to communicate with people, then then asking them really helps, and really exploring. Um, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? You know, tr trying to get more information about how people process because there's really no way to know what's going on in some, inside someone else's brain unless they tell you. You can make observations, but it's hard to say. Um, and and do specific assessments. Now there are occupational therapists and physical therapists, uh, speech therapists, uh, uh, social. Th there, there's a whole bunch of therapists who have specific 
assessment tools, um, and uh, and I'm neither an expert in all of them, nor um, uh, and and there's there's too much out there to to um, go over in a talk like this. But understand that that trying to get some assessments and some objective information about how people are processing may be very useful. Um, and let's see. Um, common misdiagnoses. So some reactions or adaptations to people's sensory processing can, uh, can be confused for other things easily. Um, it can be confused for intellectual disability, for psychosis, for challenging behavior, willful challenging behavior. Um, for example, um, professionals often use standardized assessment methods that don't take sensory processing differences into account. So, for example, what I was uh, talking to you about, sensory processing, or auditory processing, that might be slow, so somebody's giving you a test, but you miss the directions because you only heard every third word of the directions, so you're not responding, and then they assume that you're, you have an intellectual problem. That's not really the issue. Um, or you have, um, the, the information's coming in, but you're having a motor initiation problem, and a motor control problem, so you're always pointing to the thing on the right, even though you know the one on the left is the right answer, but you keep pointing to the one on the right anyhow. And your brain knows it, you're sensing it, you can see it, but you can't get your body to point to the right one. Um, or, um, or uh, someone who is very sensitive to sounds, who's wearing, um, noise reducing earphones or noise canceling earphones to help them hear the teacher who's who's being considered you know that that rude kid is not is not uh, paying attention to me and they're wearing these headphones and you know that that's a terrible thing because they're um, because they're being disrespectful when actually the whole point of wearing them was to pay attention better and to be respectful um, but it was getting misinterpreted um, their, their adaptation to their sensory issues getting misinterpreted as, as willful disobedience or, or something like that. Um, or someone having a meltdown because, because they're overwhelmed um, can be interpreted as having a tantrum or being, um, or being bad or, or something like that. Um, and uh, I, I've, seen, I've seen IEPs where someone uh, is Blind and deaf, and the communicate and nonverbal, not non-speaking, and they're being given picture icons for communication. <laughs> okay, and it's not working very well. And she's bored, so she's acting out. Um, and uh, um, you know, picture icons can't work if you can't see them, right? Um, uh, but you know. The, uh, this is, these are professionals who are implementing this communication strategy because, oh, non-communication, uh, non-speaking, pecs are the answer, you know, without taking into account that, well, there's different reasons why people don't speak, and there's different sensory things that need to be worked around in order to, um, to give them a, a, a functional method of communicating. Um, what, other, what other things have I seen? Um, uh, some, some things that sort of red flags that make me think, ooh, I wonder if this person has an unrecognized sensory processing disorder. Um, if, if a parent is reporting and observing a higher level of understanding, um, intellect and communication than professionals are, there can be a lot of reasons for that, but sensory processing may be one. Uh, parents have intuitively, over time, learned adaptations or just seeing them in different environments and so see their potential in, in better environments but in that testing environment that testing environment may not be um, the right way to get at it and therefore the professional dismissed it um, or, or misinterpreted it, um, their observations. Another thing that makes me um, think could there be an unrecognized sensory processing issue going on here is um, 
is the comment that I often see in, in the notes from professionals. He seems to be responding to internal stimuli. He, he seems to be responding to, you know, there, there's nothing going on, but he seems to be, you know, having some internal conversation or responding to something inside his own body in his own little world or in her own little world. Well, maybe, or maybe you can just hear frequencies you can't hear. Um, or maybe, um, or maybe he's just tuned into something that you're not even noticing, like a conversation that's happening a room away that you can't even hear. Or maybe he's responding to the flickering light. And from his perspective, like the flickering light of a, of a, um, of a fluorescent is like having somebody do this in front of your face all day long and you're just losing it, you know, because yeah. that, that's a pretty awful. And ceiling pans for even, mm -hmm. even you know, one of my sensory differences is ceiling pans. They make me nuts. It's like the whole room is doing this all day. <laughs> I can't stand it. Um, like, who came up with that idea? That's a terrible idea. Um, um, uh, um, so if, if people are, if, if they seem to be responding to things that aren't there, there are, there are people who hallucinate. Um, there are people who have psychosis, but maybe they just have really acute hearing and, or maybe they just, you know, maybe, or, or something, or some other sensory differences that, that you're not noticing that they're responding to, and they're actually responding to external stimuli, not internal stimuli. Um, and another thing that makes me think that someone might have, so I'm not saying that everybody who seems to be responding to things that aren't there has a sensory processing disorder, but it's worth asking the question. Um, and then another way that this, some, another thing that makes me suspect that somebody might have a sensory processing difference is um, when people complain of challenging behavior. Um, and when people are complaining of challenging behavior, I always have sensory processing different differences on the list of possible causes for it. It's not the only cause, obviously. There's a million different causes, but it's, it's one of the possibilities um, that someone is doing something to escape an environment that is overstimulating, to get them into a better environment, get themselves into a better environment, or just reacting to their, or just reacting to their environment in the best way that they know how, or that they can. Um, so uh, I, I, examples of this, um, at, at disabilities camp, uh, there was a, a kid who was very sensitive to the sound of clapping. And the group was doing all this clapping. And when every time, you know, you'd be having a nice time, and then people would start to clap, and he'd, you know, have a meltdown. And, um, and that was, and his parents were doing it as a disciplinary thing. Like, you can't, you can't respond in this way. But, but you, um, but, you know, he, he couldn't help it, really. It, you know, it was, it was, it was, it's a neurological thing. It's not something he was trying to do. Um, and and uh, tur turning on the lights. Um, I, I have a friend who, when you, abrupt changes in light, like flipping on the lights, causes an actual pain in the back of the neck, um, an actual painful feeling. And that same person, had really good night vision, and in fact was wearing, we went on a night hike, um, uh, and I couldn't see anything without my flashlight. I was, I was completely unable to, to function without a flashlight, but he was fine. Um, and in fact, and wore a baseball cap because the bright contrast light coming from cabins at, at camp were blinding him. Um, but he was fine in the dark, uh, or you know, with just moonlight. Um, so same person who has this, you know, sensitivity has this gift that, that I don't have. Um, and, um, and, you know, we already talked about, like, somebody flipping out because you cleaned their room or because you moved an object of theirs a little bit or something like that. And that could be, a, you know, a, an internal processing issue about, um, or, or visual cortical issue of, of being able to interpret um, have your brain interpret the, the visual sensations um, by having things resolve themselves into objects. Um, that you know that those are just a few of the millions of examples or millions of different ways that 
sensory differences might present in unusual ways and create confusion. So is there a cure? Should there be a cure? <laughs> um, and I, many, many self-advocates would argue that how we perceive the world is fundamental to who we are and our identity and, um, and should be accepted and accommodated and, and not changed. Um, and that's a neurodiversity perspective on sensory differences. Um, and in general, there isn't a cure. It is hardwired into who we are and there, there isn't some particular uh, fix for it. Um, with some, with some uh, exceptions, for example, sometimes we have really well. We'll, we'll get into we'll get into it later. But sometimes there are easy fixes. Like if you have wax in your ear and sound is muffled because of wax in your ear, we take the wax out. You're better. Of course, we should take the wax out of your ear, right? Um, or um, sometimes there are easy fixes, but we're talking about more complicated longer term um, things that we don't have uh, clear fixes for. Um, and, but that being said, the brain is constantly creating new connections and um, it's constantly learning, it's constantly reshaping um, at all ages. People say, oh, this only happens until you're age eight or this only happens until you're age 21 or something and then it stops, but that's nonsense. We, you know, we continue to grow and form and heal and um, throughout our entire lives. And, um, and also people can learn new adaptive skills and just understand themselves better. Like, I'm not gonna go to that exhibit hall because I know it's gonna trigger a melt meltdown. <laughs> and so, I, or I'm only, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna only stay for two minutes because that's my tolerance level before I start to melt and then I'm gonna get out of there and take a 15 minute break and then I'm gonna go back for two minutes. You know, let people learn how to deal with it up over time and and the more they can communicate then the more we can support them and do that and be not like we're not ready to go you have to be here you you know when people are young children and we don't understand what their issues are sometimes we can get in the way of their adaptive strategies um, like we need to get out of here now mom you know? <laughs> um, uh, and um, w once you understand why then then you know you can be more accommodating to that um, and so what are some of the very general approaches to accommodating sensory processing differences? So the first one is change the person. And as I said, that, that's pretty limited, but sometimes there are good fixes. Like um, if you have cataracts, great, take your cataracts out. If you, have, um, if you have a hole in your ear from, you know, from an ear infection or something, you patch it up, you hear better, great. Um, and, uh, and, you know, a, a sort of nuanced example of that is cochlear implants. So for, co for cochlear implants, when you read the medical, do, do there, how many people know what a cochlear implant is? How many people don't know what a cochlear implant is? Okay, so a cochlear implant is a device for people who don't hear that can, um, it doesn't, this is a very crude description of what a cochlear implant is and don't, but, but basically, it's, um, but basically it's, it's a device that you can implant that will stimulate the nerves to the brain when it, when it hears a sound so it can get a, around um, ear problems. And so people who are born deaf who have a cochlear implant, um, they're still young and their brain is still forming. And um, so when the cochlear implant stimulates the nerves to the brain, the brain learns how to interpret those sounds. Um, and it can, be, it, can, it can be very helpful for some people. But especially when people are older and their brain has already grown up without having stimulation from, from the ears, then it hasn't learned how to interpret that stimulation. Um, and getting, suddenly getting stimulation can be very disorienting. It can be like suddenly you have this new sense that your brain hasn't learned how to, how to deal with and it's just bombarding you with sensory information that your brain doesn't know what to do with and that, that can actually make your life quite miserable. Um, and I'm not trying to, if anybody 
has hearing problems or is thinking about this, you know, don't, don't, this is a general principle and I'm not talking about any individual case, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but just understand that there's a range of responses, some good, some bad, that can happen from an intervention like that when you try to fix the person. Um, if you look up the evidence, if you go to the medical literature and you look up success rates and failure rates of cochlear implants, then it says it's fabulously successful. And the way that they define that is if you are in a sound booth and we play pure tones, can you distinguish the pure tones? And the answer is most often yes. But we don't live in sound booths with listening to pure tones. We live in places like that exhibit hall that have lots of different types of tones at once and that come from different directions and that um, and that the brain may or may not be able to interpret, and if the brain can't interpret it, then getting all that information is just annoying. Um, it's not helpful. Um, so changing the person, sometimes there's, there's a clear and easy fix, um, but m many times there isn't. Um, adaptive equipment. There's a lot of different adaptive equipment, and adaptive equipment is getting better and more sophisticated every day. Hearing aids are getting better at um, filtering out the sounds you don't want to hear and amplifying the ones that you do. Um, glasses, I've got you know, trifocals here going. Um, uh, there, there's even experimenting, and I think probably at some point we'll get really good at this, of, of um, adaptive equipment that allows, uh, allows people to translate their thoughts into text without having to move at all. Um, so, I mean, uh, um, there's there's all sorts of adaptive equipment, and, and matching the right adaptive equipment to the right person is, you know, an art and an experiment. But um, but even simple adaptive equipment, like a pair of glasses, um, or a, a um, you know a, a weighted utensil like a weighted spoon so that you get more sensory feedback or you know e even pretty simple equipment can make a big difference in people's lives or just sunglasses or um, or a hat even to block out some of the light or um, or noise canceling earphones can really radically change someone's ability to, to function well in their in their environment um, so keep looking for it keep going to, keep, the more you understand what the nature of the problem is, the more you'll be able to match the right equipment to the right person and situation. Um, and keep looking for new adaptive equipment because people are innovating in this area every day. Um, then changing the social environment. Um, so, uh, Changing the, the social environment might be, for, for the example I gave you earlier, where someone's not able to keep up with the conversation. What if we gave them the topic of class and a question ahead of time so that they could take their time um, learning, you know, take their time thinking it through, getting the information, and then being prepared for when their time, time comes so that they, it doesn't take too long and they, they don't get skipped. Um, what if we, um, what if we used hand sign instead of clapping so that the, that kid who was sensitive to clapping could be a part of our group? Um, what if we, um, what if we helped you with your lip reading by looking directly at you and speaking in a normal tone of voice instead of moving all over the place and making it difficult for you to to use your other senses optimally. So these are the kinds of accommodations that other people can make. And people are, um, different communities are different, but, but people are remarkably resistant sometimes to making even very simple accommodations like that. Um, and you know that, that's something we can all work on, um, is, is trying to normalize accommodating people. Um, and make that a social expectation and um, being proactive and asking, is there any way that we could help you to participate? Is there, can we make this um, uh, more inclusive for you? 
Um, and you know, I, I just think that this conference is so fabulous because they've worked so hard to do just that, that they've um, really paid attention to making sure it's physically accessible, to making sure that we have translation, to making sure that, um, that we prepare our remarks ahead of time so that people who need them in different formats can get them. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to include more people if we know what the issues are and, and if we just try. Um, so, uh, adaptive equipment. Um, All right. Um, you know, somebody who might be very overwhelmed in a classroom like this might respond to this video a lot better or video streaming a lot better because it can be in a, a more, a less distracting environment that doesn't have all this interesting stuff on the ceiling and on the walls and so many people and, uh, and other things. Um, so so this, this conference is a really good example of making really strong efforts to try to include people. And it shows by the diversity of people who showed up for this talk and, and for this conference. Um, this is a much more diverse group than I typically speak to, and I, I that that's that's because of the effort they they put into including people. Um, that's really important. Um, we can sometimes change the physical environment, so we can use diffuse natural light instead of fluorescence. Uh, if that, if the fluorescents are bothersome to somebody, we could reduce the number of visual distractions. So this might be an exciting, wonderful classroom that keeps people stimulated so they don't fall asleep, or it could be completely overwhelming with too much information and I really need just a blank room um, and one thing to focus on because otherwise um, I can't deal. Um, even, at, you know, I, uh, one kid I knew could, just in linoleum, you can see what an interesting pattern there is on this one, and many linoleums are even more interesting than this. They've, they've got little speckles in them, and they're like these patterns, or upholstery that has lots of detail in it. And you'd walk in the room and just face plant, like studying the details of, of the, the linoleum, and couldn't learn anything because, because that was so attractive um, and, and so, so distracting. Um, and so, um, you know, need, just needed a much plainer environment um, in order to learn. Um, soundproofing, um, paying attention to motors and fans, and trying not to put things like, for, for if people have um, sensitivities to, to motors and fans, then things like uh, refrigerators in the classroom can be really overstimulating the air conditioning system and the hums and buzzes and fans that that makes. Sometimes white noise can be helpful, so you can get a white noise machine to block some of high, high frequency or other sounds that, um, that uh, might be distracting or brown noise, which is for lower frequencies depending on what someone's issues are. Um, for people who need higher contrast um, things, it, sometimes it helps to define a space, like have a rug or take duct tape and make a square so that you know where you belong, you know where the boundaries are. So if you have these internal, I don't know where my body is in space and I can't process it, you know, can, are there ways that we can help you to confine your space better so that you're not all over the place and can stay present in, in the room or present enough to, to, to be able to be accessible for learning. Um, so you could, how you position furniture might um, uh, help. Uh, someone to contain their body or contain the space, um, or um, or uh, um, things that help reduce distractions, like a cubby, you know, to take so that they can concentrate because they don't see so much motion and other things around them. Um, so, again, every person's unique. Not everybody needs the same accommodation. An accommodation that's helpful to one person might make it worse for another. Um, so you can have competing access needs. 
So there, there's not one solution. So it's not like, you know, I make a list of things and do that in every classroom for every person and think it would be great. It's, it's very individualized. But if you have an idea of the range of types of things you could possibly do, then you're might more likely to experiment and hit on the right one than if you've never heard of it before or never thought of it before. Um, so I, I shared this with, with that, in that spirit. Um, creating safe spaces, so if, if people are, are getting overstimulated a lot and having meltdowns a lot, is there a way to create a, a space where they're comfortable? So even sometimes there are advantages to going to places that are uncomfortable for us mm -hmm. um, because there's some benefit to it that like going to a party or going to going to class for that matter or going you know so, somewhere where you want to be there and there's really no way to get around um, get around the problems with uh, with the environment then you you might want to, to do that but you might need to take sensory breaks then so how long can you tolerate that before you need to take a break and is there um, and is there a way that we can create a place for you to go so that you can get out of there before you have the meltdown instead of after, um, and you can still participate at least at least for pieces of it, if not the whole thing. Um, and there may be some some place in your life where you are actually sensory comfortable. Um, and a lot of people go through their lives with being uncomfortable in most of the environments they're in, and you know that that's that's hard. Um, so. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't ask people to do more than they can actually do. Um, so, accommodating sensory differences, communication. Um, I, I gave you an example of, of the person who is blind and deaf who was given PECs. Um, sometimes people are, you know, think, oh, if somebody has a communication deficit, then give them an iPad, that solves everything. Um, uh, no, um, <laughs> uh, you, you need to actually there, there are different things to assess, their movement, their sensory profile, and their cognitive um, profiles. But uh, if, if you have someone who is doing a communication assessment, make really sure that they're paying attention to their sensory profile and taking that into account when trying to, de to develop a, a solution. Um, because if you don't, then it's probably not gonna be successful. Um, like if you give them an iPad, but they don't have the body awareness to touch the right button it will, that's not going to help you. Um, and um, if you can't see it, that's another problem that is not going to help you. Um, so um, here I, uh, we passed out our latest toolkit, the Everyone Communicates Communication Guide, and here it is online. So if you're working with somebody who has communication problems due to sensory um, issues, this is uh, a resource for you to tell you how to recognize a good assessor, um, how to get things funded, and how to uh, exercise your rights around communication. So education, how do sensory issues uh, relate to education? How do we work with this so that people can learn? And so in very general terms, we learn through our senses, and the main senses we learn through are vision and hearing. Um, and we also learn through touch, tactile, and through kinesthetic by doing, um, by movement, by by trying things. And so when we're trying to educate somebody who has sensory processing differences or sensory processing deficits, if someone is totally blind, then the visual learning channel is not open to you. Um, so obviously we shouldn't try to use it. Um, auditory, uh, same thing. If you're completely deaf, then the auditory learning channel is not available to you, but you still have other ones. You have the visual, you have the tactile, you have the kinesthetic. Um, so, so the first step is to figure out, um, not focus on their deficits so much, but focus on their strengths. What, what do you have to work with? Um, and, and, and then work with that. So, um, and if you can use more than one learning channel at once, like I'm doing now, I'm giving you auditory input and visual input at the same time. 
Um, and I'm also giving you some um, some kinesthetic with my gestures, and so I'm, I'm giving you, I'm, I'm trying to tap into multiple learning channels for a broad audience of people who might learn in different ways. Um, so use, use what you have open, and recognize what you have open, assess what you have open. And sometimes a learning channel is never open, like somebody who's completely blind or completely deaf, um, or someone who's paralyzed and can't move anything. Um, they can still learn. But there's also, to make things more complicated, um, sometimes at any given time, a learning channel can be relatively open or relatively closed. And so not only do we need to assess what the open learning channel is, but what state that learning channel is in. So it can be generalized. And what generalized means is that you can control it. So you can tune out the sound of my computer and listen to my voice at will. Or if I asked you to, you could turn in, tune into the sound of my computer and tune out ruffling of papers if I asked you to. Um, or uh, to tune in, or tune in and out of sounds at will, um, just by you know effortlessly without thinking about it, etc. Um, same with vision, that you can focus on my face and tune out all the interesting things on the ceiling um, or, and the interesting patterns in the linoleum floor. You can tune that out and just pay attention to me. That, that's generalized vision. Then generalized tactile is you can you know, choose to feel something but ignore the tag in the back of your shirt that's a little scratchy but you're not paying attention to it. Or you can tune into it and say, oh yeah, I have a tag back there. Mm, you, know, you, could, you could do both. Um, and movement and kinesthetic, um, uh, somebody who's generalized kinesthetic, again, can tap into their purposeful movement and are not, their body's not just going wherever it wants to go and, um, or repeating the same thing and they can't stop it, like stimming. Um, uh, stimming, can be, stimming can be a motor pattern that you'd like to stop and can't, or it can be relaxing, both, you know, it can be different situations. So generalized is you have control over it and you have control over focusing it. Global means that you're taking in everything and you're not filtering any of it. Um, so global means that ball of sound when you walk into the exhibit hall. Global means um, vision, like you're not focusing on any different thing, you're just getting all these different visual mm -hmm. sensations. Um, and I, I feel like, like I said, I feel like that when, when there's a ceiling fan on, as I'm just being assaulted with this and I can't really focus on anything um, in that kind of environment. Um, uh, so you're, if global means you, you, you can't focus at will um, on, any, on any particular sensation or something. And so if you, if for, from a tactile point of view, I can feel everything. I can feel, I, I feel you know, my undergarments. I feel my shoes. I feel the rock in my shoe. I, I feel everything. And I'm like very, I feel like I'm being touched by a million things. Um, uh, for, for kinesthetic, you might have very uncontrolled movements. Um, so global is, um, is like that. Whereas selective is um, tuning out only, you know, focusing on one thing and, on, and tuning out everything else. So um, maybe uh, like, like your kids are when they're on their cell phones and, you know, you can't get through to them and you could tell them about dinner or your day or something, but, you know, they've, they've tuned you out. They're just paying attention to what's on their cell phone. Um, or they've got their earphones on and they can hear you calling them and, you know, talking to them, but they have you tuned out and they just, you know, are focus on their music or um, so it's not that it's not that the senses don't work it's not that the brain doesn't process on it it's, it's just that they've they've select selectively tuned into one thing as opposed to the other and so people so when you're looking for what's an open learning channel they might have they might generally have hearing or generally have vision or generally have touch or movement um, but at that particular moment they may be in too global um, to, to focus. So an example of that is like trying to get the shoes on in the morning. And you know, you're you just keep getting distracted and can't, you know, like get from here to the chair 
and sit down in it. And that, you know, like there's a million things that get in the way of you getting from there to the chair. But if we put blinders on you like this, mm -hmm. you can get yourself to the chair better and then blinders here to, you know, put on your shoes in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, or, or with, with sounds, you know, different kinds of noise canceling or, or noise reducing earphones might help. Um, a lot of people that have those kinds of sensory sensitivities would like to be able to block certain frequencies and not others. That they don't want it generally to be quiet, although that's better than that's better than nothing. But it's not perfect. They would really like to be able to block specific sounds, um, which noise cancellation kind of does and kind of doesn't. It, it blocks some sounds better than others, but it might make it might actually accentuate voices. It, it's better at blocking hums and those kinds of environmental sounds than, than sounds that are changing all the time, like someone's voice. Um, and so uh, so some of those solutions may or may not be the right ones for an individual. But, um, but sometimes you can change someone to be more generalized if they're too global. Too global, you can narrow the field, you can put them in a cubby, you can reduce the environment, uh, the complexity of the environment by, you know, uh, Putting them in a smaller, plainer room. Um, uh, if, if they're um, if they're too selective, you might be able to interrupt that, like take off their headphones. I told you know, um, <laughs> uh, or take their cell phone away. Or um, I, I'm not suggesting that we um, that we take away people's coping mechanisms if they're because a lot of times people who have sensory sensitivity, um, sensory processing differences get overstimulated easily and getting getting selective is part of their coping strategies and part of their safe space. So we shouldn't necessarily always interrupt that because that may be the only thing that's allowing them to hold it together. Um, uh, but but when it's important, like, you know, there's a fire and you're focused on your cell phone and we need to get you out the door, um, then, you know, then you may need to interrupt that. And we do that, like if, if some of you are you know paying attention to the handout instead of my voice, and I call your name. You might go from selective to global you know, to generalize very quickly. Or if I tap you on the shoulder, you might do the same thing. So sometimes we can do things that that help people shift from being too selective or being too global into a more generalized state. Um, so. But in general, you're going to do best if you use what's open and what's already generalized. If they have any, if they have any learning channel that's already generalized, then try to use it. So if they're, if they're being very selective with their vision, you know, maybe give them. But but they're generalized with the hearing, then you know, maybe talk, maybe read to them instead of having them read. Or um, you know, you can you can use the open learning channel and then being able to, to flip before them. Or if you need kinesthetic, you know, have them write, um, have them write what you're talking about if they need that movement to learn or um, or trace trace what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, the different therapeutic strategies, like therapeutic listening or interactive metronome, mm -hmm. um, does that kind of like over time the purpose is to help them become more generalized and have these connections? become more, um, they're more cognizant of the connections and these connections be stronger? Is that the theory behind those types of strategies? That, that is the theory behind them. Um, the evidence behind them is mixed. Um, and I don't know whether it's mixed because it works for some people and not others, and it's hard to get the right targeting, or whether the, the quality of the studies, or I don't, I don't know what. Um, but but that's that's an approach trying trying to change the person, trying to change these neural connections. And I do think that there's something to that. You can, I mean, we've all had this experience where um, we learn something about we learn something or we practice something, and then we can focus on it more. Like when you're a kid and adults have conversations, um, you know, it's blah blah blah. Um, but then as you get older and have more information to hang it on, then you tune into those conversations in a different way. So we all, um, so, and, and kids can hear just as well as adults, so it's not a hearing problem, but it's a, it's a connections and processing issue. Um, so so I, I think there is something there, but whether a specific one of those therapeutic listening programs or something works for a given individual, I don't know. And, um, and I would, um, 
I wouldn't say never try that, but just you know take into account things like how much does it cost, what are their conflicts of interest, what is your goal, how do you know how will you know whether it's working or not, and when will you stop if it's not? Um, you know, just take those things into account when when um, thinking about it. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so I do want to have more time for questions. So if you want to learn more about learning channels, here's a book. Um, and I want to just talk briefly about encoding and episodic memory. So when people have sensory, diff just, just like I said when I did that funny dance, everybody would remember something a little bit different about it or maybe not notice it at all. Um, that, that's true of all of us. Like if you have 10 witnesses to a crime, you know, they'll they'll all have a different version of what happened. Um, but when people have sensory processing differences, that's that's that phenomenon is even more pronounced. And so, um, uh, and and that can get misinterpreted. For example, if I if I said something like, um, "How was your day today at school?" Um, or you know, how, "How was class today?" And your kid responded, "18." You might think that, okay, well, he didn't understand my question or whatever, but maybe he was talking about how many slats in the blinds, and that's what he was focused on, because he had he was selectively focused on the slats in the blinds and not on what the teacher was saying and not, on, you know, and, and so he was he was talking about his day, yeah, um, um, and that's what he took in from that environment um, at that time um, and understood your question just fine, but gave you an answer you didn't expect. Um, and ep so episodic memory, um, episodic memory is like just being able to recall our experiences and what we, what we took from them. And there's a lot of ways to, that we need to be cautious about how we interpret things because people may understand the sensation they felt but not understand the context um, or not have processed the context or have tuned out the, the context so they may know that <coughs> something was really painful to them, but they didn't understand the, the greater context about why that sensation came about. Um, and it can lead to um, interpretations of what's gone on that aren't wrong, but you know, maybe like I, I wouldn't prosecute someone based on it, or you know, I would be ca cautious about um, using that in a, in, in a, you know, to, just understand that there can be misunderstandings in a way that there, that somebody could be falsely accused of doing something inappropriate um, or, or something like that when, when maybe that wasn't really what was going on. Um, so just be just be careful about that. Um, and um, and inclusion emotional regulation. So you know people being able to remain emotionally regulated means feeling safe and and having that safe space and being able to. Escape <laughs> Noxious sensations and noxious and, and noxious things uh, when they need to, um, and um, and and those accommodations we talk to, and, and then appreciating people's gifts. So, um, so uh, here here's from one autistic uh, person. The the misconception is from his mother. The misconception is that if you watch him and you watch his behavior, you might think there's nothing inside, but nothing can be further from the truth. In Jeremy's case, he has synesthesia, so he sees words and numbers as well as people's emotions as color. He was talking about people being happy, and that was yellow, and orange was fun, and this person was a leader, and therefore they were represented by purple. And he's taken his unique perspective on the world and translated into a successful career in art where he, he does personalized portraits of people that are all color um, uh, and they're they're quite extraordinary and he's had solo um, uh, showings of, of his of his work where he where he takes these portraits uh, um, that that come from these synesthetic colors and, and they're quite extraordinary I can figure out how to get a picture down he's carefully a picture but if you want to go look at his art then then there it is um, so let we have about 10 minutes to to talk, yeah. yeah. Question: When you're trying to assess uh, the specifics of the sensory processing difference for a, a preschooler who's minimally verbal, is it an OT or is there a specialist that can get more details? Uh, um, 
it, well, it's hard, and this is a field that's evolving. So if you have a very young kid, I would keep trying. Um, I would definitely say that any kid with any sort of developmental disability should get a hearing test, just, you know, at least a straight up hearing test and at least a straight up vision exam. Um, and yes, occupational therapists have some standardized tools, how good or accurate they are, are you know, mixed. Um, it might give you some idea of if they have a difference, whether they get the right difference or not, I don't know. Um, and it, a lot of, most of those tools are parent questionnaires, so it depends on how good an observer you are and, you know, what your interpretation of what's going on, so it's filtered through that. So um, I, I would definitely do it um, and take it for what it's worth, but keep trying and keep, you know, trying to, as, as they develop more ways of telling you and you have more observations, you'll probably refine it over time.